Um, before we get started, um, does anybody, anybody get any news about any arrangement for Preacher Jack's father-in-law? Visitation tomorrow from 12 to 2, funeral at 2, correct? Okay. So still remember him and his family. Um, certainly be in prayer for that. Anybody else have any announcements or anything tonight? If not, ask Brother Tony if he'll open us in a word of prayer. So tonight, I've been doing this for a couple of weeks now, and something that's been on my heart for a while is, you know, our church is going through a lot of changes right now. We're in searching for a pastor, and um, we've had some things go on, and our numbers are down a little bit, and it seems like it's, there's always something going on that's uh, so a little bit of a struggle, something that's causing some worry tonight. And um, as I was reading my Bible and studying the Lord just kept coming back, giving me one little message. He said, don't worry. Don't worry. And I'll be honest with you, um, when my wife and my son, we joined a couple of weeks ago. We're, we're excited because we feel that this is where God wants us to be, and we feel that God is going to do wonderful things here. We know he's done wonderful things in the past, but we feel beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's more things on down the road. You see, we understand that. We've gone through some times in our lives in different churches we've been in and things like that. A lot of times when a church goes through difficult times is because Satan doesn't want anything good to happen. He's aware that God is starting to move, that God is touching hearts, and he starts fighting harder. And you know, a lot of times it's hard to realize that we aren't in charge, you know? So many times we want to be the one doing the work, don't we? We want to be the one with the shovel in our hand. We want to be the one with the hammer. We want to be the one taking care of the problem. But we've got to understand that it's God that's in charge. He's the head of the church. He's in charge. So the message tonight is going to be on don't worry. Don't worry. And let me tell you, if you ever start studying on worrying in the Bible, you're going to study for a while because there's a lot in there about it. So if you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I hope this message tonight will lift your heart, will lift your spirits as it did mine. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25, very familiar scripture. Jesus is talking. He says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than the meat and the body than the raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap. Nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? And which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And I thought about that one right there a lot. My son is growing. He's 15 years old. He eats us out of house and home, and every other day it seems like he's getting bigger. But he keeps wanting to be taller than Dad. He wants to be taller than me. And he's, he's sitting there, and he's in the mirror, and he's doing this, and he's, like, he's stretching. And I'm like, I don't think that's going to work. You just got to let things take its course. But Jesus is saying the same thing here. You're sitting here worrying about how tall you are, how long your life is going to be, or what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat. Can you really think yourself taller? Can you use your mind and add a year to your life? No, you can't. That's in God's hands, isn't it? That's God. But so many times, again, we think we're in charge. We think we're in charge. I just thought that was funny, just, just the things that's going on with him, and it just goes right along with this message. <laughs> it says, Why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 
Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In other words, stop worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow and what you're going to have or not going to have tomorrow. There's enough to do with today. You think about that. So many times we want to worry about what's going on tomorrow or next week. Or, you know, like the kids are getting ready to go on spring break. They're worrying about what they're going to do or what, they're going, what kind of fun they're going to have you still got three days of school left, guys. Take care of school. Get rid, take care of the things in front of you. But it's even more so with God. How many of us today are sitting here and we're worrying? What's going to happen to church next week? What's going to do, you know, who's going to preach this day? What's, what's going to happen there? How many people is going to show up? Stop worrying about all that. Start praying for your church. Get yourself where you need to be. Get in your Bible and study the things you need to study today. And guess what? God's going to take care of tomorrow. Don't worry about it. As I started studying this and I started seeing different things, just God shows me these things randomly. I've got one of these uh, Apple Watch things that my wife got me, and it, it shows me how much exercise I did. It shows me how much I've moved that day. I said, I could sit here and do this all day and not hardly do nothing. I could fool it, right? It'll tell you how many hours you've stood during the day. And I got to thinking about that. I said, that's funny. What if we had something like that that told us how much time you spent worrying today versus how much time you spent praying? That's my first point. Don't worry. Pray instead. Don't worry. Pray instead. Now, I got to thinking about that. I'm like, I'd be worried if that was on my watch, if that was tracking what I'm doing, because I'd probably be embarrassed how much I worry. And I'll just be honest with you. I'm a human being, and I worry a lot. I got three kids. Yeah, I've got one that's grown, one that's at college, one that still lives with me, but I worry about them all the time. You know, they call all the time, and that's, this is going on, Dad. That's going on. I've got one that's working on a, a paper right now, and I've got one across the street with the kids over there. I'm worrying right now. That's in, I can't do anything about it, though, can I? But the one thing I can do is pray. And guess what? God can reach them no matter where they are. doesn't matter how far they are. They can on the other side of the world. God is there. So in Philippians chapter 4, in verse 4, that praying instead of worrying. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. See, the Bible tells you right there. It gives you three steps of what to do. It said, pray, have a worshipful attitude, in other words. Get down on your knees to pray for whatever's going on, whatever you're worried about. Then it says supplication with thanksgiving right there. It's saying you've, you've got whatever's going on in your life. This is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to come to God and realize that he's the one with the answers. He's the one that can help you. He's the one that can take care of it. But it also says make your requests known unto God. Now, here's the thing. God already knows. He knows what's going on. He knows what you're worrying about. But he wants you to talk to him about it. The Bible says, let your requests be made known unto God. Get on your knees. Assume that worshipful attitude, recognizing that it's God in charge, not you. Bring your request to him with supplication. And you know what? I like that part with thanksgiving. Because I don't know about you, but every time I get on my knees to pray, I'm reminded of other times I've prayed. I'm reminded of other times that God has answered prayers for me. Answered prayers that I didn't even know I needed answered. Did you hear that one? 
How many times has something happened in your life you're like, why in the world did this happen to me? And on down the road you say, man, did God know what he was doing right then. He set things up for me to where I could succeed through him. See, God does things. He sees everything. He knows what's going to happen in our lives. I see some confusion out there. That's all right. God knows your life. He knows the things that are going to challenge you. He knows the problems you're going to face. See, the Bible tells us he's the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. He was at the beginning of time. He created time itself. He's going to be there when time is no more. You're just in this little part here in the middle. He's already seen your beginning and end. He knows. And he wants you to trust him for everything. You think about that. You pray to God for what you need. Pray to him about your worries and your requests. He'll take care of it. Pray instead of worry. Pray instead of worry. Now the next thought I had, what do you have to do to recognize that God's in charge? This is the hard part for a lot of people. My second point, you have to humble yourself. You have to humble yourself. I don't know about you, I'm not much of a humble person. I'll just be honest with you. Uh, sometimes I think that things have happened in my life the way they did just so I can realize that how much I need God. See, I, I've said this before many times. I used to rely on myself for my physical, uh, my prowess. I could do things I wanted. I could lift whatever I just about needed to lift physically. I had strength. You know, I had Muscles. I had things that I could do. Well, see, I got sick and I didn't have that anymore. Now, there were times and still times now that I have to have my son help me get up. That's humbling right there. Uh, I remember coming home from Dallas one time. I had picked up my son. I think he was at my mom's house, which is just right down the road from me. Picked him up on the way to my house. I walked in the door and sometimes after you have dialysis, you're very dizzy. Uh, you've got your fluid balances are all messed up. And we were walking down the hallway, and I remember all of a sudden things got swirly on me. Next thing I know, I'm on the ground. And my son, who at the time was 13, caught me before I hit the ground. I'm a big boy. Maybe you can't tell from the camera if you're at home. I'm a big old boy. I've always been a big old boy. And my 13-year-old caught me before I hit the ground and hit my head and eased me to the ground and got the phone and started calling 911. That's humbling, folks. And something that maybe all of us need to realize that we're all that close to needing someone else. That close to leaving this world for the next. You see, we get proud and we think we can do all things. We think we're our something, don't we? We think we're the big guy. We think we're the strong woman. We think we're the strong man. But guess what? It's all God. He's the one I have to lean on every day for strength. More than anything, I'm telling you, that the things that I've gone through in my life have made me realize that. I have to rely on him. He has to hold me up. That's why I love that song, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. I love that song because it's so true, isn't it, Brother Don? I can't even walk without holding his hand. And let me tell you, folks, when you've got one of your young kids that has to help you up off the ground because your, your sickness or your body has betrayed you and, and, and it robbed you of all your strength, it's humbling. Well, also, when you come to God, you have to recognize he's the one with the strength. He's the one with the power. He's the one that can take care of whatever you're worrying about. Same way with this church, folks. We're worrying about what's going on. We've got to realize it's not us. We've got to realize we can't fix it. It's God. You come to God. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, we'll start in verse 6. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Is that not good, folks? His mighty hand is waiting to hold you up. 
Now it can seem bad that you've got to recognize your weakness. You've got to put your, you know, see, in today's world, we don't like to be seen as second fiddle to anybody, do we? It's all me, 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 I, 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 I'm important. But guess what, folks? That's not the way this world was created. I don't know about you, but I wasn't there when this place was made. Were you? I wasn't. That was God. He took care of that. He's the one to put all this in motion. So I've got to recognize he's the boss. As I grew up, I knew that my mama and my daddy were the bosses. Today, it seems like so many kids think they're the boss, don't it? We was talking about that up there in the, the sound booth just now, about mowing yards. I said, yeah, I said, I've got a, somebody that helped me mow a yard. His name's Jonah. I said, he's wondering the other day why he had to use the weed eater while I got to sit on the ride and mower. I said, because I got seniority. God's got seniority over us, folks. He's in charge. We have to recognize that. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So you've got to humble yourselves to God. You have to recognize, here's a big word for you, his dominion over you. His dominion, his power. He is in charge. There's a reason why so many times in the Bible, Jesus calls us little children. We are the children of God if we've been saved. So you've got to humble yourself to God. You have to humble yourself when you're worried. You've got to recognize you're not the one that can fix the problem. But the really good part about that is, over in John chapter 14, once you pray about it, get down there and you humble yourself in that prayerful supplication, and you let him know what your requests are, how you need that help, you're down on your knees, you're recognizing he's in charge, what's he going to do? He's going to give you peace. Hey, let me tell you, when you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders and it feels like you can't do anything, and you come to an altar, whether it's at your house, whether it's down where you're sitting, where you're on your couch, I don't care if you're in your car driving down the road, when you get to that altar of repentance where you can humble yourself before God and you can lay that down before Him, He's going to give you some peace that you've never had. Because the worries of this world will overwhelm you. It will take you to where you can't do anything, where your mind is just going out every direction all at once. But God will bring you peace. The Lord Jesus Christ is the author of that peace, folks. You know why? Because he was perfect. When he came to this world, he took all the cares upon himself. He took all the sin. He did what I couldn't do. We all recognize that, right? That's why we've got to recognize we can't deal with our worries on our own. It's God. John chapter 14, just a very, very simple verse here, 14 verse 27. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Folks, if that doesn't make you feel good, I don't know what's going to. Jesus Christ said, I'm giving you peace. Don't be troubled, don't be afraid. I'm giving you peace. This is the Son of God. This is God come in flesh to this world, and He's offering you peace. All you've got to do is humble yourself and pray and say, Here it is, Lord. Take these worries from me. Whew. I don't know about you, but I like that. See, I've had a lot of worries in my life. You say, Ah, preacher, compared to some of us, you're just a pup. That's true. I think I've been through a lot in this short little life I've been here. I know God showed me a lot. But man, the peace that he brings, it surpasses all understanding, doesn't it? Again, another couple short verses about that in Romans chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. It says, Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. How many of us have peace right now? Maybe you're sitting there. Maybe you're listening to me. Maybe you're watching me. I don't know. I hope you're not paying attention to me. I hope you're paying attention to what the Word is saying. But wherever you are, maybe you're sitting there and you're worrying about something. Maybe something has totally consumed you. Hey, I understand this world is full of woe. It's full of trouble. 
And it's going to wear you out, especially if you try to deal with it on your own. But God can give you peace. Jesus Christ is waiting, just waiting for you to ask him to help. And that's what he wants to do. Me and my wife were talking about something going on. And we said, you know, we just, you want to take care of it yourself, but sometimes you have to let your kids do something on their own. They've got to learn themselves. That's the way God is with us. He's sitting there. He's like, just ask, just ask. I'm right here. I'm waiting to help you. All you've got to do is ask. But some of us are so proud and we're so not humble. We can't do it. I've been there, folks. I've been there. I've done it myself. And let me tell you, I've gone through a lot of heartache that I didn't need to go through. That I did not need to go through. My last point. I don't preach very long, especially on Wednesday nights. Don't worry. Pray instead. Humble yourself. God's going to give you peace. And how do I know that? Because he is faithful. He is faithful. How many times has someone told you they're going to meet you somewhere at a certain time and they're late? Or you get a message, they're not going to make it? A lot, right? A lot, right? I myself, uh, some of my family talk about this. They say that there's a, uh, they can always trust me and Eva to be late. So they can always, if there's something that they need to pick up on the way, they can call us and say, hey, y'all on your way? We'll say, yeah. They say, well, where are you? Say, okay, when you go by the store, pick this up. They know we're probably going to be late. You know what the great thing is? God is faithful. He's never late. He's always on time. Even when you think he's not on time, he is on time. He is faithful. Folks, let me tell you something. When you pray, you pray for something, you think you've done everything that you can, you're working as hard as you can to see someone you love get saved. You're doing whatever you can. You're putting them in church. You're making sure they hear the word of God. You're doing all these things, and you're like, Lord, why is it not happening? He's like, just wait. Just wait. Did that happen to me? And all of a sudden, he saved my daughter in the middle of a, uh, of a campsite down in Atlanta, Georgia. I knew she was under conviction. My wife knew she was under conviction. It didn't matter what we did. God was waiting. God knew the right time, and it happened next to a tent in a, kneeling in a bunch of pine needles. There was no altar. There was no baptistry. There was no TV going on. There was no microphones. There was my daughter saying, Daddy, I need to get saved. And it didn't matter where she was. God was faithful. He had her worries in his hand. And she knelt right there. Stone Mountain State Park. We got saved. I think it's a state park. Maybe. That's where we were. God is faithful, folks. I was reading this. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 1, it said, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from the unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. I don't know about Oh, I feel like I say this a lot. I don't know about you, but there's so many times that I have been that close, folks, that close. And it's only God and his faithfulness that's kept me from evil. It's only God that's kept me from that. He's the one that's pulled me back from the brink. He's the one that saved me from what I was about to do, mess up. He is the one that's faithful. He's always there. He's always on time. And he's never, ever going to leave your side once you're his. And I don't know about you, but that makes me so happy. It makes me so glad. <laughs> These little funny things happen when you have little kids, and I remember this as my kids have gotten older. Uh, my kids always used to be really scared of storms. Like they'd, be, they'd watch the Weather Channel more than the adults would. The wind would start picking up, stuff like that, and they'd start seeing dark clouds come in, and they'd put it on the Weather Channel. And I remember we knew there was a bad one coming. We were watching the TV, and you could see, you know, it's got the green with the, is the rain, and the yellow is a little worse than the orange, and there's a knot of red in the middle of it. It was bad. It was headed right for where we were at. You know, you could zoom in on them maps. 
And my daughter Emma was so scared. She was so scared. And I was sitting there and I was talking to Eve and I was thinking, we were talking, I said, hey, we might need to go down to my mom's house, there's a basement, because they're talking tornado warnings and watches. And we looked up, and that big blob of all the yellow and the orange and the red split in two and did like that and then came back together. And we're like, what in the world? My man does, the weather does funny things in, in, in this area with all these valleys and stuff. And we looked in front of the TV, my daughter, Emma was on her knees praying. Just a little kid. I don't remember, she might have been seven or eight, praying as hard as she could. And that storm just went around. You might say, well, preacher, that's nonsense. God don't do stuff like that. I disagree. I'm going to tell you this, folks. When a little one like that, that that innocent starts praying a prayer, God hears that. And I'm going to tell you this, when you humble yourself and you get down on your hands and knees and you actually get to where you can touch that throne of God when you're praying and you get to that point and you say that prayer and God hears it, guess what? He's going to move. He's going to take care of whatever you're worrying about, whether it's a storm in your life, whether it's your children, your grandchildren, maybe it's a job, maybe it's something else, maybe someone's sick, maybe someone's lost. Whatever it is that you're worrying about, you get down to that point and guess what? God is faithful. He's going to hear you. Now, he may not fix it the way you want it to, but he's going to take care of it one way or the other. I've got a couple more verses and I'm finished. Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. It says, Let your conversation be without covetedness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You, if you're a born-again believer, God is your helper. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ is sitting next to the Father. And he's pointing every few seconds that you need it, saying, that one right there is mine. Make sure you take care of that. That one's mine right there. Father, that one's mine. He's making intercession for me and for you. Why? Because you're his. Maybe you're listening to this and you say, well, I'm, I'm not his, preacher. That's easy. You just do some of the things I've talked about. You get on your knees, you humble your heart, but in your prayer you ask him to save you. You ask him into your life to change your heart, to become one of his, and guess what? Then you will have him as your helper. Most importantly, he's going to save your soul from hell. You see... When you recognize God's in control, this world's going to end one day. One way or the other, if the Lord's going to come back, you're going to die, or something's going to happen, okay? Now, I don't know. I've said this before. Everybody here that's been born, you're going to die one day, unless God comes back. Jesus comes back, all bets are off. But the fact of the matter is, you're going to leave this world. You're going to leave everything of this world here. What are you going to take with you? Well, if you're born again, if you've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, that's what you're going to take with you. That's what you're going to take to the throne of judgment. When they come out that and they ask you about all the things you've said, all the things you've done, you're not going to have any excuse, but you can say, all I've got is Jesus. That's enough. That's all you're going to need is say, I'm one of his, and everything else is going to be wiped out. But if you don't have that, if you don't have Jesus Christ, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be responsible for everything you've ever said, done, or thought, and that is going to be the sin that drags you straight down to hell. That's going to be what condemns you. That's going to be the thing that you can't get rid of. You've got to have Jesus Christ. The preacher, this was all about don't worry. You're making me worry more. If you're lost, you shouldn't be worrying. If you're lost, you should be worried every single day, every night of your life. You shouldn't be able to sleep. But I'm going to tell you this. 
The great thing is it doesn't matter where you are if God's dealing with your heart. You can get saved right now. I know I've asked this before, but I, I know they put a, a phone number up there. If you need to call, you see this on TV, you see this on YouTube, whatever you're watching. If God's dealing with your heart, you pray, you call somebody, they'll pray with you. We're going to pray here in just a minute. If you're worrying about being lost, God wants to save you. See, he made heaven big enough for everybody. He made it for you. He's waiting on you. I've got several people on my heart that I know personally who are lost. I've been praying for for a long time. Preacher, you've been praying for something for a long time and they're still not saved. Amen. I'm not in charge. God is. I don't save people. He does. Maybe again, it's like I said at the beginning, you have something else you're worrying about. Maybe you're a member of this church and you're worried about things. Maybe you're a member of this church and you haven't been here in a while and you're worrying about things. Stop worrying. Pray to God about it. Come back to church. Come join with us and we'll all pray together. And God's going to take care of this thing one way or the other. He's going to have his way. He's going to get his glory. And guess what? That's the way it's supposed to be, folks. It's not going to be Jason. It's not going to be Don. It's not going to be anybody. Guess what? It's going to be God if it's going to be right. It has to be. Don't worry. God's got this, folks. He's going to take care of it. My wife, she, she had to work tonight, and she worked last, this past Sunday night. And I was saying something about, I said, well, how bad did I sound? She goes, oh, you sounded good. I was like, you weren't even there. She said, I was listening to you on the way there. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. I can't stand to hear my voice on tape. It drives me crazy. Like I said, I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to God's word. I don't care who's behind the pulpit. It could be anybody. You have to make sure you check them up with this. You make sure it's by the book. You make sure it's by the Bible. You understand that this is where the authority comes from. This is where it comes from, folks. It's not the person. People will lead you to hell. People will lead you down the way you shouldn't be. Don't follow me. Don't follow any preacher that gets up here. You follow God and you follow his word. You follow a good man who's trying to do the word of God. That's what you've got to do. You've got to check up on them. But wherever you are tonight, stop worrying. Trust in God. Humble yourself and pray. And he'll take care of your worries, folks. The Bible says it. It's not just me. I'm not just up here trying to be throwing out what my opinions are. I got plenty of them. Trust me, we'll talk afterwards if you want my opinion. But right here, this is God. He's telling us not to worry. He's telling us to take it to him. In prayer and supplication, humble yourself. He's faithful to give you the peace that you need. That's the message tonight, folks. I hope it touched you. I hope God talked to you the way he talked to me. I'm going to ask everyone to stand for just a second. I'm going to pray, and we're going to be dismissed. Wherever you are, you can pray with us. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we want to thank you, dear Lord, for what you've done for us. Thank you for what you're going to do. Most of all, I want to thank you for your word tonight, dear Lord. We hope, dear Heavenly Father, God, that we've done the things that you would have us do. We know that your word will not return void, dear Lord. We know that what you send out does what it's supposed to do. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, God, if there's someone out there that has a worry on their heart that's been consumed by it, dear Lord, that they understand they can bring that to you in prayer, dear Lord, and that you will take care of it. Most of all, dear Heavenly Father, God, I know that there's someone out there who's lost. I know that there's someone out there who needs you. I hope they're praying right now, dear Lord, for you to save their soul. Most of all, dear Lord, just, just let them know that you love them, regardless of what they've done in their life, that you can save anyone, that you are in charge of this thing, and you want to be their friend. You want to be their Lord and Savior. Lord God, touch them now as they pray. Touch them, dear Lord. Let them know. That also that there are churches that will pray with them. And they can come and join in a fellowship of believers, dear Heavenly Father God. And we'll welcome them with open arms. Lord, we just ask you now that whatever else is done, whatever is said, for you and your glory alone, we love you tonight. We thank you.